Beyond Maine's beautiful landscape, there's a dark, desperate crisis, a substance abuse epidemic. We set out to capture the faces and stories caught up in it and discovered there is a science to addiction. There is also a way out. These are the Voices of Hope. From seeking a high to seeking an escape from self, experts in addiction cite five underlying reasons for addiction. Trauma, co-occurring mental disorders such as anxiety, depression, or bipolar, sexual and gender issues, genetics, and prescription drugs. That summer before I went into freshman year in high school, is when I started trying Adderall, Vicodin, um, cocaine, ecstasy, um, really anything I get my hands on. I did it and would have done it um, just to get out of myself. I was just looking to not have to deal with me, myself, and my life. My freshman year, I had gotten into this really bad pattern. I looked awful. Like, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, I knew I looked bad. I looked so bad that I was begging and hoping that somebody would say something to me. Just anything. I was just hoping somebody would care. But all I wanted was a hug, or someone to eat lunch with me, or some sort of greater acknowledgement. And it was in that exact instance that I was like, nobody cares, I'm going all in. I started to rebel in school. I started to fight in school. I started to not do what I was told. I tried to, I never did any schoolwork and I struggled in school. I never felt like I was smart enough. I never felt like I could do well. So the anxiety around not being enough uh, forced me to not try. I'm acutely aware of the flesh prison I'm trapped in. And, and I think the, the desire for escape from that is something that ultimately led me to drinking. The first time I tried heroin, I think from that day on, that morning when I woke up, stood on my feet and asked my mom for $20, I think that's when I was like slowly putting on those shackles and cuffs to my addiction. This whole idea of I just wanted to be on my own, I wanted everyone to leave me alone so that I could drink and use the way I wanted to, I thought, you know, oh well, I'm, I'm free, like I have to get more free, I have to get to where I want to be, but the the jail of addiction just was, it, I was going backwards from the goal that I really wanted. Drinking felt at the time like something that was giving me more freedom. Like it felt like it was giving me freedom to be social in situations that I wouldn't normally have felt comfortable doing it. And I, like, I didn't see it at all then, but looking back on it, it was like the more I relied on the drinking, the more it was actually like, it was taking the freedom a way for me to be able to do anything without it. The longer that I, I used drugs and drank, um, the less freedom I had because I couldn't do what I wanted anymore. I woke up in the morning and I was like, my first thought would be, how are you gonna get a drink in your system or how are you gonna do drugs? So there's really no freedom about it um, once I got into my 20s because I didn't feel like I had a choice anymore. The process of addiction you know, it starts out because the drug is so rewarding in the beginning, and then it becomes like a prison sentence. You're imprisoned in your own mind. You're trapped in these compulsive behaviors that you're doing because your brain just is, is constantly craving the drug. You don't even enjoy using it anymore. I guess I was searching for an escape with drugs and alcohol, but for a long time I don't think I knew what that cycle was going to look like, that I was imprisoning myself. I didn't understand that. Um, I didn't ever know that there would be so much tormented torment associated with the escape. I spent my 23rd birthday later that year, um, followed by the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th birthdays in prison, in treatment, or in sober living. 
I was definitely a prisoner to drugs and I felt like I had to use it every day and if I didn't have it, I would go crazy and I would have to chase for it, chase for it, chase for it. I did feel like a prisoner even when I was using drugs because you're just locked in with yourself and I was always isolating and drowning myself in alcohol and drugs and just being alone, like just not wanting to feel. It was slow and subtle, but it was building walls around myself that were, they were both disconnecting me from other people and keeping me away from really being able to like enjoy the things that I loved. Addiction to me feels like, like I can't stop thinking about it. I'm trying to put money together to figure out if I have enough to be able to get the next amount. It's constant anxiety. Even being outside of an actual jail or prison, I've always kind of felt that I was in a prison, I guess, and mainly in my head. Um, you know, a mental, emotional, spiritual prison, I guess. My poor father tried so hard to drag me out of places, you know, find me, search me down, push me into detox again, and I'd just leave detox and I'd find a way out because the obsession to use and abuse crack cocaine and heroin was so powerful that I could not stop. Um, lying, cheating, stealing, manipulating, doing things that I am very ashamed of today that I did. Um, I'll never forget the first time that he drove me to detox and I'm surrounded by these people who I am nothing like in my mind. They're all heroin addicts. They're all, you know, crackheads and not what I was at the time or thought I was. And I did not think I was going down the road toward that in any way. I was convinced that I would never do those things. Oh, come to find out later on, I was very wrong about that. The lengths that our brain goes to to try to explain the behaviors that are driven by addiction um, is really a result of us having this big cortex that allows us to make sense of the world. And so it's not surprising that someone uh, with addiction tries to make sense of what they're going through um, and can come up with uh, lots of explanations and justifications for their behaviors when they're driven by something that's really beyond their conscious control. I had been drinking when I wasn't supposed to be and when I was then with my girlfriend, she could tell I was off. And rather than admit to having been drinking, I let her like believe that there was something mentally wrong with me, like that I was having a stroke or something. And so she took me to the emergency department. My family, they were like, you should probably go see a, a neurologist then, like if you think that's what happened. So I work at a hospital and like basically said, yeah, okay, I, like, I know a neurologist, I, I can, I'll go in, I'll, I'll see my PCP, I'll get like blood work done, all of that. So I said I was gonna do all of that. And told myself, all right, well, if they were gonna draw blood, like there'd be evidence of that. So I initially said to myself, all right, maybe they would just do a pinprick on my finger. So I took a uh, thumbtack and pricked my finger to have evidence of that. And then I said to myself later, actually, if they were gonna do blood work, they would do like the whole arm blood draw. And so I did the same thing with my arm, uh, which is harder than you would think. It takes a lot of work to put a thumbtack into your arm. Um, but I did it and none of this felt crazy to me. It's interesting um, how stigmatizing addiction is that people would rather call it medical or mental health problems rather than an addiction problem and kind of the lengths that someone will go to to um, convince themselves that it's, uh, it's not an addiction that's leading to these behaviors. It's almost like the smarter you are, the more compelling the reasons and the bigger manipulations you can make to achieve the goals. Um, and that can backfire because people will think that someone is lying and cheating because they are a bad person rather than 
they are lying and cheating because they are a person with a bad disease. Doctors now refer to it as a brain disease, acknowledging addiction is a chronic and often treatable medical condition involving changes to circuits in the brain involved in reward, stress, and self-control. Our brains are constantly changing and adapting. Um, so if you're using a drug and it's having this intense effect on your functioning, and it's changing your personality and, and your behaviors. Of course, that means it's changing your brain. There are so many changes. There's something called a T2 image on MRI, which can show you white matter changes in the brain, which is more subtle. The white matter is, is like the coating around the nerves. And you can see changes, especially in young people who are using various drugs to the white matter. Uh, and, and it's sort of fascinating from a scientific perspective but you don't want to be that individual that is interfering with your brain's ability to process information uh, because you thinned out white matter in certain areas of your brain. In December 2014, I'd been in jail for about a week and, um, and I found out that I had the opportunity to get high. and. Um, that somebody had some heroin and I was in the process of, of getting high in jail and um, another gentleman, he got high before I did and he ended up uh, overdosing and passing away. I really had to sit there and, and take it all in and something just clicked in my head and I said, man, I have, I have a chance, I have another chance. I don't know why I have another chance, but I do. So what am I gonna do with it? And that's when really everything changed. I just knew that like this was, if I didn't do it this time, it was over for me. I know what my life will look like. I, I will be dead. I will be in prison if I'm not dead. I would still like to think that I can control my life, but I really can't. I need that something that's bigger than me that I either look up to, talk to, pray to, meditate to, um, for me. Uh, everybody's different, but that's what my recovery looks like. And if I don't have that and I'm not sober, then everything else is gone or will be gone very soon. The reason why it's different um, this time around for me is because I've, I've done this before over and over and over again. And the jail life is just not what I want anymore. This is tiring like I I want to get sober I'm tired of having to wake up to and get through my day relying on a drug or alcohol just to get through the day like I want to wake up and genuinely be happy to start my day without having to alter my feelings 2001 when I was here I was incarcerated um, within this facility um, with my brother uh, who ended up going out to the pre-release out front. I went out to the street. He went out there and he uh, overdosed and passed away. So that kind of, that really, it should have woken me up. My father died of an aneurysm very suddenly. He was 64 years old. I um, was 57 days sober when he passed away and I did not know how to manage those feelings and emotions without drugs and alcohol. I was able to stay abstinent from drugs for eight months. And that was my longest stint of abstinence prior to my, my recovery now. I picked up right where I left off and I started using in a way that um, didn't even know existed. Um, I overdosed 13 times. I was dead on arrival nine times. It was my final crossroads. I knew that if I did not get sober this time, I was going to die, a drug addict. And it was, it was going to be a very painful, slow death. I was just like, this just is never gonna work out for me. I'm never gonna like be able to get sober. And I ended up having like one last night and it was like two or three days of a complete blackout. 
and I, I came to it in Spring Harbor, the mental hospital, that was like the lowest point where I, I thought to myself, if they let me out of this hospital, I'm not going to survive. And that was when I decided to go to long-term treatment. My recovery was very difficult. Nobody has an easy recovery. Nobody can just wake up and be like, whoa, that's it. I'm not going to use anymore. I figured it out. And if there are people like that, then good for them. But that wasn't my experience. When I was in Spring Harbor, I remember telling one of the nurses that I was there because I wanted to get sober. And she looked at me and she was like, do you know how hard that is? I was like, I don't care. I'm here to get sober. This is what I want to do. She's like, do you realize how much reprogramming of your brain you have to do? And I leaned in and I said, I don't care. I'm here to get sober and I'll do whatever it takes. There's help. There's hope. You don't need to live the rest of your life like this. It starts with acknowledging that you want change, that you're miserable and you want out of this life. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. But by seeking help and, and going into recovery, you know, you're really going to take a look at your psychology and, and, and your, your life history and your trauma and you're sort of going to break down how it is we can interfere with this process from trigger to, you know, you using what happens, you know, mentally during that chain and where can we intervene to stop it. So when I was in my darkest moments and felt, felt so alone, I thought nobody in the world could identify with how I felt, what I'd done. Um, and I think that was really just part of, um, part of the sickness I was experiencing um, and, and my kind of delusional ways of thinking. And as soon as I was willing to reach out and ask for a little bit of help, um, people were there. Um, I just had to take the first step and do it um, because nobody was ever really able to help me until I was a little bit willing to accept that help. I was willing and broken. It was desperation. It was all very horrible internal emotions that I was brought to um, through my addiction. I would say that the desire for a new way is what that intangible thing was. It was desperation for anything but what I had been living. And in turn, for that desperation, that's why they call it the gift of desperation. I had been introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous for many years. I was very familiar with the program. Um, I thought I knew what the 12 steps were, and I was very wrong about that. But I've, I've come to realize now that um, there is a lot more complex than reading steps off of a, of a poster board on a wall. My sponsor helped me to believe that I am worthy of this too, and I can recover just like anybody else can. I didn't believe it right away, and it took a long time to get there, but I finally started to reap the benefits that this work did for me. You know, the recovery process for me has required me to do so much work on myself that I never would have done unless it was like a requirement for me to stay sane and alive. People say addiction is the opposite of connection. I believe that uh, to be true. Um, but it, it's also, it's, you know, this, I'm a fiercely independent person and I don't like to be told what to do, but I also had to realize um, that like I have weaknesses that I need other people to help me with. And, and by being honest with more people, they're more able to help me. What it really came down to was a sense of empowerment that I never had. In school I always felt dumb because they kept telling me I was in lower classes than I should have been. In my family I always felt scared and afraid and the world kept making me feel so many things that I didn't want to feel that I realized my only opportunity to have a shot at life was to do something that would empower me. And that no matter what happens in this world I've given myself a gift that nobody could ever take away.
it was more the end game was that I saw other people that seemed free. They were calm. They had purpose. They had direction. They just seemed happy, right? And very content and fulfilled. And it was, it was that that I had so desperately wanted my whole life. And it was that that I had sought through drugs and alcohol that gave me glimpses of that feeling but never really held true. I'm involved in 12-step recovery. I have regular meetings. I have people that I'm in close contact with um, who are, you know, people further along the line than me or, you know, have strung together more sober days than I have um, and people with fewer. Uh, I think being part of that community is really helpful for me. There's active work as part of that. The, you know, the actual 12 steps of 12-step recovery helps me to, um, better understand myself, to also kind of clear up some of the wreckage of my past uh, so that, you know, so that I can kind of move forward in a way that, you know, I, I feel good about myself. Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous has saved my life before, and I know it can do it again. Um, getting a sponsor was really important, having someone to talk to all the time. Um, when you're having a hard time, it's always good to have someone that's there to listen to you, rather than facing things on your own. And it was just like God moment after God moment, like things lined up, I was able to go get help, and I was sick. I, I had withdrawals like I had in the past. It wasn't like a fun experience. Um, and I went to a 12-step retreat, and for the first time, actually, you would think that I would have seen it before, um, but the disease model was explained to me. The chronic use of substances does damage the brain. There are connections that are lost. There is loss of receptor density. Dopamine systems are out of balance. There are a lot of changes that happen. And as a consequence, when they stop using, nothing is enjoyable, nothing is pleasurable, nothing gives them the same effect that that substance had given them. They are in a hypodopaminergic state where they don't get pleasure from anything. It's very challenging to go on. My program or my prescription for staying healthy has changed a lot over the last almost seven years. And I started with AA, liked it, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't my full source. What I personally do is I have a really great community of women that I study the Bible with and we walk through life together. And that is a very replenishing source for me. That's a very incredible source for me is to have them in my life. And it took a very long time for me to reach that place where the desperation was that intense that I could then become willing and surrender to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is where the divine intervention from God came into play for me. I cannot describe this to anyone. I really can't understand it myself completely. I've tried. Um, I know today that no human power on this earth could get me sober. There isn't a single person, place, or thing that is going to get me sober. A power greater than me, I choose to call it God, is a God I don't know, but it is something out there that is bigger than I am that intervened and gave me the ability to be teachable, to become willing, to surrender, and get out of my own way. I went to rehab and I really just started listening to people that had been in the place I was in that moment. Maybe not that exact place, but a place in their lives where they thought nothing could get better. Um, they are really just broken down and tired of living a certain way. And um, they started to guide me and, and really just kind of give me suggestions of how I could get well um, on the inside, um, not on the outside, not trying to make everything look well on the outside like I, I had done in the past, like put on the show that everything's okay. 
While I was there, they really set the foundation of being honest and getting back in line with my moral compass and my values. It's never going to be as bad as you think it is if you tell the truth um, because it's those like secrets and trying to cover stuff up that will just, I would have relapsed again and I, who knows if I'd still be sober today if I didn't get honest about that. I eventually developed this life that I was like, this feels sustainable to me. Like, this feels good. I started sponsoring other women and I started helping other women and I felt like I was finally on like this path that I could keep walking on. I didn't feel the need to, there's nothing I need to run from. There's nothing that I can't approach like head on. I was introduced to a group of people whose lives had dramatically changed as a result of applying uh, by working the 12 steps and applying the 12 steps to their everyday life. Um, I was quite taken back by their, their sincerity, their, their knowledge, their ability to sort of explain my disease from personal experience in a way that uh, no doctor or therapist had ever been able to really reach me with um, and break it down in a way that like really made sense. Now freedom has evolved to be really nothing is going to dictate what I have to do. Um, wake up in the morning and not have to think about drinking or getting high and to sit there with a cup of coffee and have my brain be quiet while I say a prayer, or do a meditation. Um, I can go where I want. I can, can be whatever I want to be. Um, and there's really no limits. Sponsoring other women has been a huge part of my recovery program. Giving somebody else hope and showing somebody else the way that was so freely shown to me is what makes this program tick. It's, it's what makes it work. I can relate to these girls that I work with. They can relate to me. They believe me. I think that I'm here and that my purpose is to carry the message of hope and um, try to reach out to people who are suffering and, and show them a way out. Um, and also to help women who are going through the horrible things that we go through on the streets and in the depths of drug addiction. Um, I feel like that's my purpose. My purpose is to send a message of hope to whoever needs it. Parents, spouses, to children of drug addicts and alcoholics. They deserve it. And if we're alive and our heart is beaten, there's hope. The first time I really felt like I had arrived to my recovery, the first time I really felt, felt it in my soul, I was um, two and a half years sober at the time, and I went to Ireland, and it was beautiful and it was amazing and I was on the west coast of Ireland and we were driving through these beautiful hills and valleys and I saw all these sheep farms and I saw all this beautiful scenery and I looked out over the coast and I just started crying because I couldn't believe that I was alive to experience it. And I just sat on that tour bus sobbing <laughs> with all of these friends I had made. And I realized what a blessing it was just to have the opportunity to try at life, let alone getting a second chance. I was one of the first girls that walked into the day one residence and completed the program. Especially as an adolescent, I needed to be away from my family and be somewhere safe and, and have the opportunities that were given to me here. So I'm not sure what my recovery would look like without day one because it, 
allotted me the time and space to be able to build a very firm foundation. Hey, Molly. Hello. Day One is very unique for the state of Maine because we are the only organization that has residential substance use treatment for teenagers. Kristen Cianali is program manager for Day One's residential facilities, one in Hinckley for teenage boys, the other in New Gloucester for teenage girls. Here at our residential facility we have girls come to us for as early as 13 years old and as old up through till about 18 years old. And that is an extremely important time of development in their lives. They're trying to figure out who they are. And in the midst of trying to figure out who they are, they have substances on board. Here they wake up, they have a hygiene routine, they get ready for school, they have some school time, they have structured break. After school, they have group. Um, in the middle of school, they also have group. In the evening, they might have an AA meeting or a peer recovery coach that they meet with or a therapy session or a art project that they're working on. And over the weekend, it's not just let's sit around and connect with friends. It's also, you know, let's go out for a rec activity. Let's get our bodies moving. Let's think about the connection between the body, the mind, and our experiences in life. Like what brings us joy and fulfillment. In our residential facilities and a lot of the clients we serve at day one, it's the kids who are really have gone to an extreme uh, disadvantage, if you will, due to their uh, upbringing and then getting into substance use. Dr. Jeffrey Alberg, a family practice physician, is day one's medical director. I um, just didn't realize the magnitude of substance use, substance use disorder. Uh, sometimes to an extreme extent out in, in the environment. And as a family doc, the most uh, startling thing that I've seen was the, and have seen, continue to see, is the multi-generational uh, challenges that, uh, that these kids have. Many have gotten to where they're at in substance use because uh, perhaps their parents led them in that direction. Sometimes uh, grandparents, uh, certainly other, other relatives, have been uh, really the, the start of, of their use in, in too many cases. As a, as a client moves through the program and is doing better, we give them what we're calling our bedroom three or our senior resident room. So this is one of our standard rooms. We have more beds than For a lot of these young people, yeah. this time in this space is enough time to remove them from their environment, to get them asking questions about the things that they actually like, they actually want to continue for their future. Um, a lot of them haven't thought a lot about their future. And that's what we get to do here is we get to imagine what could life be. It can be this, but it could be something else and what do you want that and how do we get you to that path if that's where you want to go. To be able to look at these young lives and say no matter where you are, you are worth more than the moon and the stars and to be able to tell them how important they are is something that I think everybody needs. You need to be aware that this affects everyone, every, every walk of life, every population. You can't tell when someone's in treatment with me because they look like anyone else who's out walking the street. People just say that, well, nothing's working because the numbers are going up. And I think that's really an unfair conclusion to come to because the lethality of the opioids that we see now is entirely different than what I saw, you know, 10 years ago where, you know, I didn't have patients overdose and die that often at that period of time. It was largely heroin. If somebody did overdose, it took, you know, one or two doses of Narcan to reverse their overdose. Now it's, I almost never see heroin. I almost exclusively see fentanyl or one of the fentanyl analogs that's similar. And you know, it requires six, eight, 10 doses of Narcan to reverse folks out, in other words, save their lives. Dr. Elaine O'Connor is the addiction medicine lead at Kennebec Behavioral Health in Skowhegan. 
I travel an hour and a half each way twice a week to come to work here um, because I love what I do and these are my people. Um, I'm from rural Maine um, and this is where I'm supposed to be. These are the people I'm supposed to be serving. Um, and really this is the sort of front line, the, the hard edge of the substance use disorder epidemic in the state. I have a situation from you know, a patient in the past that you know, she was so sick and so scared and so overwhelmed and needed treatment. And her dad basically put her in his vehicle. They came in, he was practically like lugging her in because she was in full-blown opioid withdrawal. And full-blown opioid withdrawal is like laying on the floor. She's writhing in pain because every muscle in her body hurts. She's throwing up everywhere. She hasn't slept for two days. I mean, you know, the idea that this person could function, you know, in this state of full-blown opiate withdrawal is just nonsensical, frankly. You know, I can see the tears in his eyes just, you know, and I'm just like, it's okay, we're going to figure this out. And I, I told him, you know, there's this medication that I'm going to use and it's going to be, you know, it's going to change everything. And, you know, he had never heard of the medication. And I said, just bear with me. I know this feels really bad, but we're going to get through it. So I sent a prescription, you know, of this box into the pharmacy, you know, and I called them, you know, four or six hours later when I was home that evening and I just, you know, how you doing dad, just want to check in. And he said, that's an amazing thing, that medication. He said, you know, my daughter went from what, you know, you saw earlier on the floor, writhing in pain and vomiting and everything else, um, to being normal and functional again. There are so many good cases and there are so many situations where you bring hope to patients and to families. You're part of, of a human story in a way that probably nobody else has ever been part of their story. I mean, I, I know patients' deepest, darkest secrets. Um, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm honored that they have the courage to share that with me. I have a young patient that we worked with for probably five or six months um, who recently passed away just this past weekend. Um, I learned about it, you know, when I sat down on my couch and opened up my computer. We knew um, she was really struggling um, the last couple weeks. Um, it had gotten pretty bad and she was using most of the time, using more often than not, I would say. So most of the times when she came in, she was positive, but um, she was still trying to get better. And I think one of the hardest parts is working with folks who just you know, desperate, I think it's for lack of a better way to put it. I mean, she just was struggling. Like you could just almost see her hanging on with like her fingers. Um, but it's, it's hard every time. And it's the young lives of young people. I mean, I think about in the thirties, she's a mom, um, had recently gotten back in contact with her children. And then, you know, to die after that, I feel like for her, for her family, for our community, for her kids, you know, because I just can't imagine what that must be like. She leaves you, she comes back, she leaves you for good. And it's just the whole, the whole way it's affecting, like, the fabric of our state, really, for lack of a better way to put it, is remarkable and horrible and I think to some extent people just feel like it's just one more and I just it's hard um, and I don't know I feel like society's starting to pay attention but um, you know I was talking to my dad the other day on the phone and he's like I don't get it Elaine like 500 people die you know a year like if this was some other thing you know people would be up in arms and just you know doing everything they could to make it better It's 5 a.m. People ask me, how do you deal with this work every day? And my answer is my Peloton, my bike. Uh, I start every morning on the bike, and um, I, it's the way that I just sort of start the day. It gives me the energy to go into the day, to sort of put the shield back on and walk out and see patients and do what I do. I ride for typically about an hour and it launches my brain, it, it gets me going, it turns things on, makes me like able to go about my day and start doing things. And, um, but I think it also helps get up, I mean frankly, if I'm carrying stuff from the day before, like it, it lets me sort of 
work that through. Um, and you know, there have been many an hours that I cried most of the ride. You just have to have a way to let the body cope with it almost. I mean, the energy that comes from the stress or the trauma that you take in or, you know, you just, you have to have some way to sort of get rid of that. With medication-assisted treatment, and there are a variety of drugs that can be used to address this depending on what level of addiction and what will work for that particular individual. Arlene Jakes is in charge of programming at the Cumberland County Jail. She's also in charge of the jail's medication-assisted treatment, or MAT program. We can help stop the cravings. We can rest the brain so that it can begin to heal and allow that individual to take back control of their life. So an individual who comes in on an active prescription for methadone, for example, or Suboxone, then through our medical department, we can assess that. We make connections with their provider on the outside, and we're able to continue that medication here so we don't have to put anyone into withdrawal. We don't have to make anyone take a step back. We can simply continue that work and they don't want to die and so what their hope is is that can I get on to methadone? Can I get on Suboxone before I leave? Yes I know I'm not using drugs but can I get on this medication so that when I get out there and those cravings start and that pressure starts will I have the strength and hopefully the support I need to make a better decision for myself and to keep my life on track the way everybody here truly desires it when people come in here and say to me, I'm tired of this life, I don't want to do this anymore, I believe them wholeheartedly. They're not lying to me. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to come back and then they're going to keep using because we know how difficult and chaotic that addiction can be for them. But they're sincere. Nobody wants to live that life. In 2020, the state of Maine made medication-assisted treatment, MAT, available to inmates struggling with opioid addiction at each of the state's adult correctional facilities. Maine's county-operated jails are working on plans to provide MAT to inmates who received the medication prior to their arrest. All right, come on in. You can have a seat on the other side. All right. Hospital systems are also working towards solutions. Maine Health's Integrated Medication-Assisted Treatment Program, or IMAT, combines talk therapy with medicines that can control cravings and lessen withdrawal symptoms. The medicines help a person feel normal again so they can focus on therapy and rebuilding their life. It helps me get through my day-to-day -day and want to be sober and want to be happy and healthy and. That's what it gets me, it gets me there, you know, where I need to be, especially with my IMAP program and everything in this, it's great. Rihanna takes part in the Maine Health Program. For her, it's been a very long cycle of use and abuse, and this young mom wants to break that cycle. So when I became a drug addict, it was because I was at my lowest. I was in a very abusive relationship. Uh, my partner went to prison for five years. I knew I didn't want to die, but I didn't want to deal with all of my pain of everything. And so I became an addict. I was addicted to oxys for about a year. Um, I didn't have any oxys one day. And I found a bag of heroin. I didn't want to kill myself. I knew I didn't want to kill myself, but I wanted to get high. And I knew right then and there that I had a problem. It was rock bottom all over again. Uh, it just happened so quickly. And um... Josh is also in the IMAP program. He grew up playing sports. He was also a Boy Scout and was even involved in the D.A.R.E. program. But by 12, he was drinking, soon binge drinking and blacking out. Rehab, stints at sober houses, detox and probation were then followed by six years in prison for robbery. 
the turning point was when I overdosed. And I guess I, in a way, was kind of intentionally hoping that I would overdose because I didn't know how to live sober and I didn't know how to live as an addict. It actually scared the crap out of me. It scared me so much that um, it kind of really shook me awake and um, realized that that wasn't what I wanted. I was so close to um, death at that point and losing everything and betraying you know, everyone that I love um, by letting the addiction win, um, it made me realize that that's not what I wanted to do. And getting enrolled into the Suboxone program gave me the ability to get back on my feet so much quicker. They help teach you how to cope with your PTSD and your trauma and how to get over it in a safe and healthy way. And I think that comes down as to why people are drug addicts. And that's the core of it. You know, they get down into the core. That was probably eight or nine months ago um, that I've been on the medication. Um, and since being involved into this program, I guess um, I've had a lot of access to um, some like professional point of views, um, some people who are, you know, trained specifically in dealing with substance abuse, people who uh, understand psychology and the workings of the mind, and um, people who know about trauma. Is strong evidence that people that have substance use disorders uh, have been living with painful or traumatic experiences for years in their life. When they begin to use substances, they gain an awful lot of relief from those experiences and thus the beginning of what has developed into a dependence. The data is something like 75% of the people who have an opioid use disorder have had some form of trauma in their life. So uh, the egg comes before the chicken quite often. Licensed clinical social worker Paul Murphy is a substance use treatment clinician at Maine Health's IMAP program in South Portland. Figuratively, we're trying to get somebody to a really different place from where they are when they walk through the door. And the first is as close to abstinence as they can possibly be. Uh, help them get from an emotional place where they feel insecure and unsafe and afraid to a place where they start to have a sense of strong self and personal security. Um, that's the first movement that we want to see and it's a great success when we see people actually do that, start to sh change before our eyes in a, in a very slow way but a very meaningful way. Providers um, send us referrals through the emergency room. It's a system Noelle Hoy knows well. She was a patient, struggling with substance use disorder. Now she is one of Maine Health's peer leaders. So I think that that's a pretty amazing thing, helping people navigate sort of, you know, what's available or just navigate the process. You know, how would you know if you haven't been through it? There's no way to sort of know that yet. So I think it's great that there's people to help navigate those things. I feel like being on um, or being part of a uh, a treatment program like MAT or, or being um, supported by uh, a group of doctors and counselors and therapists and stuff like that really says a lot to those people around you that, that know you and they see that you're taking your recovery very seriously. It has saved your life. Yeah. Yeah. I could cry, yes. <laughs> They're great people. They do wonderful things. And it's so easy to be honest and open with them and to really, really work on your sobriety. They've been my angels, that's what I call them. So we bring in the most vulnerable men in the city who are experiencing homelessness or substance use and we, we give them a hot meal every night, we do their laundry, we give them a safe place to sleep. Um, and sometimes it's just sitting down with them and having a conversation. 
Milestone Recovery runs one of two standalone detoxes in the state of Maine. Its two-tiered mission is to empower individuals with mental health and substance use disorders and often means a three to seven day stay. You can't really push recovery on somebody. Um, I think a recovery path can mean different things for different people, you know, and I think, you know, part of their recovery at first is, you know, they have to really learn how to be, you know, to get off the streets, learn to live life skills, um, all different levels. Guys have been on the streets, you know, up to 10, 15, 20 years. I had overdosed twice in the same day and then I came back to detox and was in pretty bad shape. I had a couple broken ribs. Uh, my arm was infected from shooting up. Um, and the doctor asked me what I was gonna do different and I couldn't answer. I had no idea what to do. Um, and she just said, you know, let us let us come up with a plan for you. Um, try to get some rest and we'll, we'll put something together. And they came back with the plan of six months of treatment at the Serenity House. They wanted me to do 90 meetings in 90 days, then join a volunteer group and try to get into a job that would help somebody else and also help me at the same time. Bobby Sheehan worked his way up. He's now a shift leader at Milestone. So, you know, I, t I take a lot of a lot of pride in, in understanding what these guys are going through and letting them know that they're not alone, letting them know like I, I was in the shelter, I was in the detox, I was doing all the same things that they're doing and, and it's possible to not have to do that anymore. I mean, I've been to a few different detoxes, I've been to a few different rehabs and Milestone was by far the most welcoming for me. Um, some of the other detoxes I've been to were more hospital-like, clinical, I guess. Um, for me, Milestone was a place where I could breathe, where I knew I was safe, I could be comfortable. Um, I had at least seven days where I didn't feel anxiety, where I, you know, I didn't have to run, where I could just sit and and be comfortable. If you or someone you know needs help right now, go to the knowyouroptions.me website. You will find immediate help that's closest to you. Next time on Voices of Hope, the ultimate toll of addiction and the family members left behind. And I realized that I didn't have any more kids. But, uh, well, both, both of my boys were gone. The last six months were torture. Every morning before I would go to work, I would go to his room to make sure his chest was rising and falling. And every night I would drive home praying that my son would be alive when I walked through the door because I knew he was slipping. Plus, the family restored. It has helped us Tremendously, it was kind of like being in a really, really dark room and somebody finally opening a door and you could just see somewhere to go. Recognize myself for the first time in the mirror today. Spent so long in the dark Now I'm stepping out I'm finally feeling brave When you're lost inside a maze That you created for yourself in your own brain You'll start to lose sight of the light I've been there before Today, for the first time, I was able to forgive myself. Today, for a new life, I could stop being somebody else. I never could see the sun, but now. 
I'm not afraid. 